Hey, good afternoon to you. 306 News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news coming up today. Uh, boy, we have a lot for you. Luke Rosiak from the Daily Wire talks to us about another betrayal by the Fairfax County School Board. This is a huge story. Luke shares it at 3.30. 4 o'clock, David Strom from Hot Air joins us. 4.30 from the Heritage Foundation, Delano Squires reacting to Barack Obama attacking black men for not supporting Kamala. Jorge Bonilla is here from the Media Research Center at 5 o'clock. We talked to him about Kamala Harris's big Latino town hall last night. And Christian Hyens is with us at 5.30. He's a political analyst and a very smart election modeler who he knows what's happening in Virginia, and he'll share it with us. Can't wait for that. And you can talk to us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. I want to begin today with a note of gratitude to my dear wife who put up with me watching Kamala Harris's Univision town hall while we were lying in bed last night. I had the, I know these are everything about this. These are bad habits. You shouldn't be on the phone in bed. I was, and you definitely shouldn't be watching Kamala Harris, but I'm, I'm lying in bed and I'm, I'm watching this on my phone and uh, I'm, I'm cringing. Uh, I'm, I looked a lot like most of the audience members did, I think, which was bored out of my mind. Uh, as Kamala Harris uh, attempted to field these questions from what Univision billed as uh, undecided Hispanic voters from across the country. Now, we're learning a little bit more about the composition of that audience today. And uh, it was, of course, more than meets the eye. Uh, and uh, I'll get into some of the details. But first, I just want to talk about kind of how Kamala handled herself last night. Uh, there were so many cringy, cringy moments uh, you know, including when she broke out her accent to, to it, it sounded like she was trying to adopt a, an Hispanic accent for a fraction of a moment. Well, first of all, thank you for the question. I hope your family is OK and your home is OK. Yeah. OK, I hope your family is OK. What is that? What is that? What is she even doing? I never know what she's doing. Uh, Kamala Harris uh, trying out a, like a pseudo Hispanic accent last night. Uh, she was asked some questions about. You know, what are you doing to help illegal aliens in the country? And she was bragging that, well, she wants to give everybody amnesty. I'm not sure how this helps in the election. And the first bill we offered Congress before we did the bipartisan infrastructure bill, before we did the work on gun safety, before we did the work on investing in chips and science, the first bill we offered within hours of taking the oath was a bill to fix the immigration system, including creating a comprehensive, earned pathway to citizenship for hardworking people. That would be amnesty for illegal aliens. So that was, uh, I would say, honestly, probably the most radical element of the night last night, as Kamala Harris was emphasizing something that is deeply unpopular among the American electorate, which is why she's trying to get a new electorate. Uh, that, that bill, as the Federalist points out today, was known as the U.S. Citizenship Act. <laughs> And it would have allowed foreign nationals residing in the United States prior to January 1st of 2021 to apply for temporary legal status with the ability to apply for green cards after five years if they pass criminal and national security background checks and pay their taxes. After a three-year waiting period, all green card holders who pass additional background checks and demonstrate knowledge of English and U.S. civics can apply to become citizens. In other words, amnesty. Amnesty. Yes, your first act in this country was to break our laws. But congratulations, you've been awarded American citizenship. That was Kamala's plan. She advanced it last night. It's wildly unpopular. In fact, the American people are on the side of mass deportations right now. That's the majority opinion of the country. They'd like for people to not be here who are not supposed to be. Uh, then uh, Kamala Harris was told a story. Uh, of There was a woman um, who, I believe this is the woman uh, whose mother had died just six weeks ago uh, the way she describes her own story she was she's an anchor baby she was uh, here in the United States of America her, her parents were here in the United States of America gave birth to her she became an American citizen by virtue of that and uh, she told her story about how she was able to get her father legal status but not her mother who recently passed away you and I have something in common we both lost our mother oh and I'm an American citizen, born to two Mexican parents. Um, they were here before I was even born. They worked their whole lives. Uh, but with the way immigration laws change over time, I was only able to help my dad get his 
legal status uh, squared away, but not my mom's. My mom passed away just six weeks ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. And she was never, ever able to get the type of care and service that she needed or deserved. <laughs> sorry. Take your time. Take your time. So my question for you is, what are your plans or do you have plans to support that subgroup of immigrants who have been here their whole lives, or most of them, and have to live and die in the shadows? I'm so sorry for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You must remember your mother as she lived. Mm -hmm. I, have enough, I have enough of a feeling about your strength that it probably comes from her to know. She would want you to remember her as she lived and not as she died, okay? Mm -hmm. So, let's take it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Then she went on to say that amnesty is what we need. We need more amnesty. Uh, so that's uh, Kamala Harris presenting very radical positions here. Uh, she also, at the end of her remarks, uh, uh, this was just a, this was a bizarre moment. It's like very, this is very uh, lefty coded. Is that, maybe that's the phrase? This is like the way lefties speak. Like normal people are like, I, you know, I'm going to pray tonight for you and your family. That's, that must be a really tough time you're going through. Kamala Harris instead said, uh, tell me her name and then I'll repeat up, I'll repeat half of it because I didn't hear you or understand you. And I will mutter it as an incantation. You know, my mother came to the United States at the age of 19. She was by herself. Came alone by herself. She raised my sister and me, Maya. And um, she came alone by herself with me and my sister. <laughs> is the math working there for you? I don't think she was alone. I think she was with you and your sister. I know what it is like to have a hardworking mother who loves you and to lose that. But I know that her spirit is alive. I know her spirit is alive. And will you tell me her name and let's speak her name? Maria Dolores. Sorry. <clears throat> Maria Dolores Figueroa. Maria Dolores? Mm -hmm. Okay, we speak her name, okay? Yes. She got two-thirds of the way there. She didn't get to the Figueroa part. Uh, so there's a Kamala Harris. We speak her name. We speak her name. Thanks for that. that I'm not sure how that helps, but thank you for, for doing that. Uh, Kamala was also confronted by uh, a woman who uh, is basically the book of Job. Everything about this woman's life sounds completely miserable. She was like, she's, she has said she's, ex she's homeless right now. But somehow Univision found her and got her into the crowd. Uh, she is she suffered from a heart attack. She says she has long COVID, uh, and then she can't get disability payments from the federal government. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> I I was really eager to see how Kamala would handle this one. My name is Martha. I'm 62 years old and currently homeless. In 2020, I had a heart attack. Mm. Then I got diagnosed with long COVID, which will disable me. For the rest of my life. Can you imagine the internal monologue right now for Kamala Harris as she's doing this? Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. What am I gonna I lost my job, my income. I had no choice but to apply for social security disability. It's been three years I've been waiting for a decision. Mm -hmm. Because of no income, I lost everything. I have no health insurance. I can't get medical treatment that I need. And my question for you is, how will you help the disabled people yeah. so that they can get insurance yeah. and make America great again? Whoa, 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 whoa. wait a second, wait a second. Um, what? what was that last part? <laughs> uh, are you allowed to say that to Kamala Harris? Uh, what's going on? How are you going to make America great again? Asked the homeless heart attack victim with long COVID. How are you going to make America great again? Uh, and here's how Kamala handled it. Disable people yeah. so that they can get insurance yeah. and make America great again. So I'm so sorry for everything you've been through. Um, you're but don't you dare speak to me that way ever again. Point about long COVID. Finally, I it was actually part of pushing to make sure that long COVID is now recognized under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it is now recognized as being a disability for the purposes of allowing you and people who have long COVID to be eligible for disability benefits. Yeah, although the woman just told you that uh, she doesn't have any of those things. She doesn't have disability benefits. She doesn't have health insurance. Uh, so how's that working out for her? Oh, don't worry, I fought for you, so you're good now. 
She's like, no, I'm not. I'm not good at all. Make America great again, she said uh, during that during that segment. They had to basically reg- wrestle the microphone away from that lady, by the way. They're like, all right, enough. She kept trying to talk after Kamala Harris didn't give her a satisfactory answer. Kamala also spoke to a woman called Wendy uh, and told her, uh, and Wendy asked a really basic question that Kamala keeps getting confronted with, which is, how are you going to lower grocery prices? And then Kamala rambles and doesn't give actual answers. Uh, mi pregunta es entonces... So my question is as follows. What are you going to do to help the middle class so that the cost sure of the cost living of doesn't does not destroy, destroy us? The middle class. Thank you for the question and your point. Listen, I know prices are too high still. You know prices are too high still. Okay. And we have to deal with it. Here's how I feel about it. Again, you've I heard my you story. I, I come from the working class. I'm never going to forget oh, where that's I come right. from. She's from a middle class family. And part of what we have to do is build what I call an opportunity economy. That's still mindless pablum. Where people have the opportunity, like you have described, for you to be able to work hard and your five daughters have an opportunity to then do what they and what you aspire for them to be able to do without having to worry about just getting by. I want you to be able to get ahead. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, this this stood out to me. Um, Kamala was asked at the very end, say something nice about Trump. Would you say three nice things about Trump? Could you come up with three? And here's how she handled it. She just attacked him. Thank you for the question. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let me start with this. I, I... Basic, based on a life experience, I know that the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. And part of what pains me is the approach that, frankly, Donald Trump and some others have taken, which is to suggest that it's us versus them, whoever that may be. So she's attacking him. And having Americans point fingers at each other. She's attacking. Using language that's about belittling people and calling them names. Attacking. And meant to make them afraid and and live in fear. Just lying and attacking. I don't think that's healthy for our nation. Mm. And I don't admire that. And in fact, I'm quite critical of it coming from someone who wants to be president of the United States. Uh Uh-huh. So... Um, I called this, by the way. I said to my wife last night, I was like, watch. She's going to say he loves his family, and then she won't say anything else. That's all she's going to say. I think he, um, I think Donald Trump loves his family, and I think that's <laughs> very important. I think family is one of the most important things that we can prioritize. But I don't really know him, to be honest with you. I only met him one time. I love it. And she backs out of her compliment. She's like, actually, you know what? Probably not. On the debate stage. I'd never met him before. So I don't really have much more to offer you. <laughs> And then she just stopped. She just gave up. She's like, eh, forget it. I don't want to do three. I'll do one, and then I'll take it back. Now, who were these people? Who was in the crowd, exactly? Well, we've discovered quite a bit more since that town hall aired last night. And uh, I want to share some of the details with you in a moment, including the fact that it appears that some meaningful percentage of that crowd was paid to be there. They couldn't I guess generate enough enthusiasm for a for a Univision Hispanic town hall with Kamala Harris. People were paid to be there. So this uh, Univision town hall was done in Las Vegas last night with Kamala Harris and the crowd. They, they Univision told us it was composed of undecided Hispanic voters from around the country. But journalist Michael Tracy was waiting outside the doors. They wouldn't let him in the room, so he was just waiting to see if he could get a hold of any of the audience members, and he finally did. And here's what he learned. He told Glenn Greenwald on his podcast after the town hall. But I did get a little bit of additional information because, as you noted, Glenn, and I'm extremely intrepid, and I don't take no for an answer. So what I figured out was that there were two segments of the audience who they filled this, quote, unquote, town hall venue with. One segment were who were actually entitled to stand up and ask questions, meaning the host called on them and they stood up and asked a question. These were people from around the country, Latino voters, who were flown in at the expense of Univision, which is odd. I mean, we're in a swing state of Nevada. There are plenty of people, I'm sure, in Clark County, Nevada, who would have been more than happy to go and ask Kamala Harris a question. But instead, they they flew people from uh, Florida and Wisconsin and California and other places to Las Vegas to ask these questions that I guess the only they could ask, like, 
Uh, one question was, you know, just to, bas to basically prompt Kamala to give her generic latitudes on immigration policy or um, other stuff. Uh, the final question was, can you name three virtues of Donald Trump? So the, like, the feel-good question that sometimes candidates get asked where they have to praise their opponent. Um, so that was strange. Uh, but the there were also other people in the audience at this event who were not called upon to ask questions, but were just filling seats. And that duty, it so happens, was outsourced to a company called Fans on Q, Fans on Letter Q, which is it's one of these strange services who which if you never really thought about it. You would never really think about it having existed, or you never think about the fact that it exists, but once you hear that it exists, it makes sense. It's a company that goes and puts out casting calls for audience members to attend <laughs> stuff like uh, music award shows. So this company is used for the Latin Grammy Awards, where they have people you know who go and dance at the award show, but they're selected and vetted ahead of time, I guess maybe to be young, good looking, whatever. And they, they, they employed that same service for this event. Yeah, they did. And by the way, I just want to correct something I said before. I, I, I assumed based on that, that they were paid. If you go to the fans on Q website, uh, they say that the seat fillers, quote, do not get paid, nor do you pay us to be a seat filler. It is a free voluntary participation. But uh, so Univision, I guess, shopped out for a, 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 a crowd and got it from fans on cue. I'd, did you know that by watching it last night? And what kind of people were in the crowd? Uh, I was decided before, but a lot of people just wasn't. So you were already decided before you came? So it was very... Uh, yes. You were? Okay. So were you an undecided voter or did you know? I, I already know I was going to go for Kamala uh, before then and now that just kind of like solidified it. Univision's press release for this event declared that it would be composed of Hispanic voters who are undecided in the presidential contest. That's that's the quote. Michael Tracy spoke to a bunch of them. They were like, no, 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 I'm, I was for Kamala from the moment I walked in there. <laughs> oh, it's weird. It's weird. A lot of dishonesty out there, isn't there? Fascinating. Luke Rosia is going to join us about more deceit, this time out of Fairfax County. It turns out they literally sold the people of Fairfax County out to China. The details ahead. Hey, good afternoon to you. It is now 335 News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up on this program, we've got David Strom from Hot Air at 4 o'clock, from the Heritage Foundation at 4.30. Delano Squires reacting to President Obama's attacks on black men. Jorge Bonilla joins us 5 o'clock from the Media Research Center, host of Miami's Radio Libre. We'll talk to him about that big Univision town hall last night. And Christian Hines is here at 5.30. We're going to chat with him about the data in Virginia. How's that early vote looking? Can Trump actually win this thing? You can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Uh, speaking of Virginia, this headline really caught my attention uh, last night. Uh, be, and I sent, immediately sent it to Corey alongside some expletives uh, because the headline from the Daily Wire is Virginia school system sold China a handbook on how to clone America's top STEM school. What? Virginia's school system is selling China's our secrets? What is happening here? Luke Rosiak joins us now. He's the investigative reporter at the Daily Wire, who all too often is the one guy breaking all of these very interesting and important stories. Luke, good to have you back with us, sir. Hey, Vince. Thanks for having me. Okay, so the the school system in question, it turns out, is Fairfax County. Tell us what happened. Sure. So Thomas Jefferson School for Science and Technology for you know many years regarded as the number one school in the country. Yeah. Um, China took an interest to it kind of wanted to replicate that obviously we're sort of competing with them economically who can have the smartest people entering the workforce who can you know develop all these high-tech computer things um and you know being here in the nation's capital tj was one of sort of the crown gems it's almost like in the arsenal of what what makes the united states a powerhouse um 
but for some reason, you know, I guess Fairfax County, they only have hey, a four, four billion dollar budget. They, I guess they didn't didn't give enough money for TJ to, to renovate. So they created a nonprofit to raise money for a renovation. Well, Chinese entities associated with the Communist Party of China start donating to this nonprofit. But it's not just donations. They're actually entering into contracts to give things to China in return. Those things include physical blueprints to the school, personalized visits, curriculum, and even student work, like actual like homework assignments that kids made. They just kind of gave over to China without getting permission from the kids or anything. Um, so this is, these are things that you or I couldn't get as you know, residents of Fairfax and Americans, but they're giving them to these Chinese people that are saying they want to create a clone of TJ. And there are emails from the assistant principal of TJ where she says, yeah, they have a $1 million contract to create clones of TJ called the Thomas Schools. And sure enough, if you type it in on Google, you'll see this Chinese website where they now have 20 things that they call the Thomas Schools that are clones of TJ in China designed to make Chinese kids be these really smart scientists. And they've got the former principal of TJ seemingly on the payroll on this steering committee alongside a former CCP official. So they want to renovate. I'll just take it back in time and make sure I summarize this correctly. They want to renovate uh, TJ. They launch this outside organization to raise funds to do it. China becomes a massive donor to that organization in exchange for obtaining the blueprints and even the student, the private student schoolwork of students who attend TJ? Yeah, that's right. And so this all occurred between the years 2014 and 2021. And it looks like this nonprofit, the Thomas Jefferson Partnership Fund, I think raised about $7 million in that time, $6 million. And most of that money, $3.6 million, came from China. <laughs> so um, why didn't we know this until now? If, if, if this was so great, why wouldn't they brag about this uh, as it was happening? So Fairfax County tried to conceal this at every turn. We know about this thanks to the activist parents group, Parents Defending Education. They submitted some public records requests and their Freedom of Information Act. Well, Fairfax came back and said, to get the, the, that info, you're going to have to pay us $37,000. So, number one, it shows you how much correspondence they had with the Chinese, that it would be this much paperwork to go through. But also they're trying to charge Americans like 1% of the money they got from China. They, China created 20 schools based on this proprietary IP about, about Thomas Jefferson, and they sold it to them for $3.6 Meanwhile, they're going to charge Americans about 1% of that total amount just to read the paperwork about this. So they give, and this has happened to me as a reporter, they give you these inflated, almost absurd dollar amounts to, do, to get these FOIAs. And, you know, I've been a reporter for a long time, and you get them from the federal government, usually it's no problem. Sometimes they take a long time, but it's free. And with Fairfax, I've never encountered any government agency that does this to the extent Fairfax does. They'll often just reply, well, that'll be thousands of dollars, so you probably want to drop your request. <laughs> with me, a lot of times they don't even give you a dollar amount. They just say thousands of dollars. So it, parents defending education called their bluff. They said, all right, $37,000. All right, well, who, do we, who do we make the check out to? So you can just picture FCPS kind of freaking out at that point, like, oh, my God, they're actually going to pay? We just figured they would drop it. And so parents defending education deserves a lot of credit here. They actually paid a lot of money to get these records that we as Americans and Virginians should have had a right to automatically and it exposed it, and it showed kind of why they didn't want to turn it over, because it showed that the school directly, and the, the principal was on the board of this nonprofit. And so now you have Fairfax kind of came in, well, it wasn't us, it was a nonprofit, and it wasn't a contract, it was a donation. All those things are contradicted by these records. They show them deliver, like literally referring to it as a contract, and they show the school doing things pursuant to this contract. So if it was a nonprofit, then how did they have the power to send teachers over to China? How did they have power to access student work and blueprints to the school? The principal was on the board of this nonprofit. So it's this insane arrangement with obvious national security ties. Um, and here we are basically in Fairfax County. We've yes. got, you know, 
CIA headquarters is here. Pentagon is a few miles away. If anything isn't on the national security radar, you know, if uh, national security implications should clearly be on our radar. But you have the president of the previous president of TJ, yes. Evan Glazer, saying, well, it would have been racist to discriminate against them because of national origin. Well, also, so, I mean, we're not talking about Asian immigrants. We're talking about people who currently work for the government of China. Also, I mean, doesn't it stand to reason that now China has its fingers in in, in a school where you have high achieving American children, perhaps the, the children of high achieving adult Americans who are perhaps in our government work in it or in support of it. Uh, many of these children will go on to very important professions given their aptitudes. Uh, it does seem that it may be a big problem. Yeah, and I mean, there's emails here where a Thomas Jefferson employee wrote that Chinese officials wanted a quote, how to clone TJ handbook. Yeah. Um, they requested student materials, a list of lab equipment, and so on. And they said, you got to put it on a thumb drive because Dropbox isn't accessible in China. Um, and so, you know, the, the current principal, Ann Bonita, Bonita Tibis, uh, was involved as well. As this contract was coming to an end, China basically ramped it up and said, look, we need all the information now because we're building these schools in China. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and, and by the way, uh, you, you know, so looking at these tax records, they try to say some of it was for cultural exchange. There's no <laughs> cultural exchange here. When the U.S. tried to set up these outposts in China, China shut it down for right. national security concerns. Right. Um, they have their things coming over here, but when we try to send ours over there, they don't want it. So, there's so one obviously of the, they're kind of basically yeah. take our proprietary IP. Sure. So one of the patterns that we've seen with China when it comes to education, especially higher education, is they launch these Confucius Institutes at colleges in the United States. And the goal is to basically pump a bunch of Chinese communist money into the school. And in exchange for taking that money, the school promises to um, teach China's version of, of events and history. In other words, in, in order to spread Chinese communist propaganda inside of our higher uh, uh, learning institutions. Do you see evidence of that within TJ? Well, we don't know because, first of all, they tried to charge $37,000. Parents defending education paid eighteen grand, so they got about half the documents. Yeah. So there are still more documents. I know that uh, Governor Yunkin has been trying to get answers. I don't think he's been able to successfully do so, which only raises more concerns, as you mentioned in the beginning. If you were proud of this, you wouldn't be hiding it, and they're, they're being very cagey about it all. Um, but, you know, to your point about Confucius Institutes, University of Maryland just a couple months ago in July entered a settlement with the Department of Justice where they agreed to pay $500,000 to resolve False Claims Act allegations because they were also hiding money from Chinese government involving military projects. Uh, so, yeah, there's obvious national security concerns. There's economic competitiveness concerns. And these are, you know, these, this is an American school that yeah. is pretty important to our country. So the whole thing is just kind of bizarre, all to just for like $3.6 million. They just kind of handed it over. And as you point out, um, a spokesman for Glenn Youngkin indicated to you that, there, that the governor is very concerned about this uh, and, and what it means and that the Virginia Department of Education is going to get to the bottom of this. What about at the federal level, if you know anything about that? I, I, my, my understanding is at the federal level, there's normally – a rev supposed to be a review process of foreign investment in the United States. Would, would this trip any wires? I don't know. That's a good question, how that would apply to K through 12. I know that there's been, um, for, for many years, spanning multiple presidential administrations, real concern about um, China's attempts to, because they spend a lot of money on what they call the United Front, which is basically efforts to manipulate foreign countries and basically conduct espionage and so on. Um, again, it was even, you know, in the Biden administration that they're pursuing the University of Maryland and others. Um, you know, I've heard that it's kind of become the Biden administration is less hot on it than prior administrations were. But even Biden is not cool with China coming in and trying to basically get an edge by cloning things, cloning our, 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 our you know, most valuable assets. So, yeah, there could be some legal issues here. There could be some tax issues about, you know, they're, they're saying this was a nonprofit. They're saying it was a donation. But the nonprofit is giving away things that aren't theirs to give. And it isn't a donation. It's contingent on it's got strings attached. 
Um, but the other thing that's kind of interesting is that TJ, at the same time that these Fairfax County school officials were selling the recipe to this high-performance school to China, they were kneecapping the American version by getting rid of the merit-based admissions that made it what it is. So China is trying to replicate the TJ of, say, eight years ago, where we had it had the number one test scores in the country. But right now they're having to offer remedial math because they've done a bunch of DEI stuff and yes. neutered the admissions, saying it's racist to get to to let in only kids who are the best at math. And I think it's telling that China didn't take the DEI components; they took the old TJ yeah. model because right. that's the one that helps nations compete. Yeah, here in the United States, we're now limiting the number of Asians who can get into TJ. Meanwhile, China has 20 TJs where that's the only type of person they allow in. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it, it really is amazing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luke Rosiak, for constantly digging in. We'll appreciate any updates you get along the way. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Vince. That's Luke Rosiak with The Daily Wire. Follow him on X for all of this. It's really crazy stuff. Imagine a, a secret deal with China to the tune of $3.6 million. Yeah, sure, we'll give you every last detail, including private student schoolwork uh, in order to help you build 20 TJs. Uh, so that's great. That's Chris. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Why are men attracted to Trump rather than Kamala? What's happening there? A big conversation coming up with Delano Squires in the next hour on that subject as Obama is attacking black men for not being compliant enough to the Democrats. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. He's not alone. A bunch of elite Democrats doing that. Uh, let's go to the phones. I've got Bob calling in from Loudoun County now on line one. Hello, Bob. You are on the Vince Colony Show. Hey there. How you doing, Vince? Well, I just came to share. Uh, I'm an alum of, a, of uh, an Ivy school, and I go to a lot of alumni events in the area. And, and uh, you know, I'm a Republican, but, you know, at these events, Everyone pretty much assumes I'm a Democrat. And one of the interesting things that came out in a conversation that uh, I was a part of, or rather in the group that was having the conversation uh, with the member of Congress, he had said that Harris, literally, Harris have another, would have another problem if she tries to throw Biden in the bus since she agreed to protect his legacy as a condition of the endorsement. Um, you know, Biden right now, you know, he stepped out. It was supposed to be about his age and not about his policies. And you know, when Harris started to lean in to her, uh, how should we say it, Obama spirit and wanted to represent herself as an agent of change and all that stuff, you know, she came out and made some comments that, uh, you know, changing from the Biden, Biden policies, you know, Biden stepping up to the mic and saying what he said, uh, you know, about, um, you know, how, how the governors are doing well and, you know, he's working with the governors pretty well yeah. and how the two of them were arm in arm on policy. That was basically a shot across the bow saying, you really don't want to go there because you'll have a whole other problem. So, okay, this is so fascinating. So, Bob, just to, to make sure I understand all of this, you are an alumnus of an Ivy League school. You went to yep. an alumni event. At that event, there yep. was, I presume, a Democrat member of Congress. You're talking with a small group, and, the, and, and that Democrat member of Congress says, yeah, there's a, there's a deal that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have. They, they have an arrangement, which is, he supported her for president, and in exchange, she is not allowed to in any way imply that he failed as president. Not on any issue. He's, he, she can't criticize him at all. Is that right? Exactly. And, and you know, intuitively, that, that, her, that was her best shot, really, of, of, you know, winning over the independence. But she can't go there. I mean, she's tried to go along the hems of it. But if she goes there, Biden will just come out and contradict her. Right. And her campaign strategy is entirely wrapped up in this idea that she's a fresh face, that she's completely new. She's going to be a, a change of pace. She's not the status quo. Uh, but then she runs into the obvious question is, OK, well, then how are you different than Biden? And in this past week, she was asked that question at least twice that I'm aware of. And on both occasions, she said she couldn't name a single thing that would make her different. And when you heard that, Bob, you said that makes a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. I was like, she has, she has to say. She doesn't have a political goal. He tries to adopt the soul of, you know, other candidates. But, and that's why she goes point to point. And now she said, he had no problem. Mm. Uh, Bob, thank you for this call. Yeah, Bob's breaking up a little bit at the end there, but I think we got the meat of it, the hook of that story. Bob finding out that 
Democrats are talking behind closed doors. There is an arrangement between Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. Don't you dare say one negative word about Joe. Don't you dare. And so when she's asked, what would make you different? She says, um, nothing. Yeah. What a great catch 22 that she's stuck in. I hope this ends up with a Trump presidency. Stay with us.